Hi, I'm Nikki Ramirez. I'm the founder and principal consultant at hranswers.org. We're an Arizona-based HR consultation firm that focuses on providing practical and impactful HR consultation to small business leaders so that they can really focus on what's important to them, like their goals and their employees' well-being. So I'm super thankful to be here with you today and share some information that I have gathered along my journey on ways to be successful in your first HR leadership role. And along the way, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey and share a little bit of wisdom that I have gathered from those who have gone before me. So just wanted to say off the bat that it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I always enjoy getting together in an innovative virtual format like we're doing today or a more practical, old fashioned classroom setting and learning with and from other HR leaders and business professionals. And I'm really looking forward to participating in sessions today and sharing what I've brought and prepared. So thanks for joining and thank you for taking time to come to this session in particular. So what are we gonna talk about today? What's the plan? So our session today is going to cover a number of things. We're going to, of course, talk about the mistakes that you want to avoid making in your new HR leadership role. And these strategies that I'm going to share with you are practical strategies that lead to success for leaders of any level of experience. So these bits of advice, again, bits of wisdom that I've gathered from those who have gone before me, they're practical for anyone in any phase of leadership, but especially when I think back to my first HR leadership role, these are the things that made the most impact or if I would have focused on them a little bit more closely, would have definitely increased my success or brought me together with my team faster. So we're gonna talk about the journey. You know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. So we're gonna talk about that journey today and how you can craft your journey to be enjoyable and successful. We're gonna talk about the three mistakes that we want new leaders to avoid in HR and um, practical ways to avoid them. So I hope that you leave with some actionable ideas, things that you can take back to your desk or even work on at the conclusion of this session that will help you be happy and successful in your role. We're also going to talk about something that is important if we want to find long-term success in our careers, which is finding a way to align our professional goals with our personal style. Because when we do that, we know that our team um, can be much more successful. I've got some optional homework for you today, and I also prepared um, a special invitation. So I'll share that with you at the, at the conclusion of the session. So thanks again for joining us. And let's go ahead and get rolling with our three things to get right in your first HR leadership role session. So to begin with, I just wanna get us all on the same path for the session, knowing that every person's leadership journey is different. And each of us find our gifts and our talents and the things that we like to do most through our own journey. And hopefully along the way, we work with leaders that help unlock potential in us. And then we can duplicate some of that for the people that come to work on our teams. So in order to consider um, where journeys begin, I was doing a little bit of reflection. And so we're gonna rewind here. We're gonna rewind way back to 1992. And we're in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, where I'm from. I live in Arizona now, but originally from Minnesota. I was in high school and I was really working hard to try to figure out where I was headed with my life. And of course, when you're young, you really don't know. And my path has taken twists and turns along the way, um, each of them teaching me some pretty valuable lessons. But we're back in 1992, I'm in high school, trying to figure things out, trying to figure out what am I good at? What do I like doing? And it turns out I really enjoyed learning languages. So of course I was studying English. I had picked up French in eighth grade, and in high school was allowed to also begin studying Spanish. And I was coming to realize that learning different languages and the practice of improving communications and focusing on communication was really a strength of mine. And more importantly, I was discovering early on that language is the key to making connections with those in our lives that we care about, who are important to us, and with whom we need to have productive relationships. And so as leaders, we need to be concerned 
about a, you know, focusing on learning the language of our employees and those important those people who are important to us in our organizations we really need to take time to focus on ways to communicate with them that will align for success and so you know it's in the back in my high school career i was discovering that the world was a big place and that was based on my study of languages and it really opened my eyes to a larger view of the world but at the same time made the world a much smaller place because I felt like I could communicate with more people. And so that was a, an interesting time, but it helped me also realize that the distance between us can be shortened and conflicts can be resolved more easily the more that we focus on communicating and speaking one another's language. And so this goes far beyond foreign language, which of course is the study that I'm talking about specifically but this goes into the language of relationships and the language of organizational behavior as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, my journey and, and where it's taken me along the way, how my Bachelor of Arts in Spanish Literature and my MBA have proven to be very helpful in my HR career. And I'll also share with you briefly how I made a successful shift from organizational management into HR leadership. And I wanted to pause and just take a moment to say, listen, regardless of where you are in your journey today, and regardless of any of the struggles you may have faced along the way, or what destination you've set for yourself, the journey is really yours. Um, it's yours to make the most of and enjoy. And so I hope that you, like me, you will find a way to enjoy your HR leadership journey and that when you feel that you are struggling to enjoy it, that you're able to take a step back and talk about personal alignment, like we'll talk about again down the road here today, um, and really get on track to, to continue your successful HR journey through happiness and enjoyment. So back to my, my, my language study here for a minute. So I learned that I really did love the study of language, foreign language, but I also realized that I needed to learn the language of things like finance and strategy and marketing. And so I did that. And of course, I learned that I loved the language of compliance and rules and regulations, where a lot of us spend some time in HR, of course. And the best part is that along the way, I also learned that I had a gift or a talent for helping others learn the language of compliance and rules and regulations. And so I really wanted to find a way to apply that in my work. So before we go on any more with my story, let me share just a quick summary of the three mistakes that HR leaders should avoid making in order to find success and happiness and enjoyment in their HR careers. So the first one that we wanna think about here is avoiding being the expert in everything. So a mistake that I commonly see new leaders make is that they try to have all the answers. And I am here to tell you briefly that you don't need to have all the answers. And we'll talk about how to solve for that in just a minute. But oftentimes a leader who is willing to look beyond their own expertise is a respected leader. The second mistake that I often see new leaders making is becoming complacent about growth and learning. So oftentimes we get so involved in the day-to-day -day in leading our organizations that we fail to recognize the importance of continuing to grow personally and professionally. So we'll talk about that as well. And then the third mistake that I see new leaders making that we're gonna talk about avoiding for you is not adopting an attitude of personal accountability or not focusing on building a culture of accountability on your own team. So let's talk about how to avoid these really common issues that I see pop up for new HR leaders. So I already shared with you that early on in my career that I discovered that I had a gift for interpreting and teaching about rules and regulations. And that was something that I really wanted to tap into. And I was so thankful that the leaders that I had in my life were willing to let me exercise that that talent and that passion so that I could continue to grow. And when we are working with our teams, 
we want to ensure that we are able to, of course, share our expertise and our experience, but we want to be able to focus on leadership and strategy. We want to be able to solve the biggest problems that come to the organization. And so, you know, not focusing on being the one with all the answers is an important way to properly spend your time and a proper way to engage in building up your team. So we want to ensure that we agree here that being gifted in one area of expertise, that it doesn't mean that you have to be an expert in everything. Again, it doesn't mean that you have to have all the answers. And remember that one of the most powerful things a great leader can do is turn to their team and look around the table and say to them, what do you think? What has your experience taught you? What do you think we should do in this situation? I know that you've encountered this before. What did you do in the past and did it work? So sharing the decision-making, sharing the expertise is a great way to build connections and to build relationships. And again, it frees you up to work on bigger problems or to work on strategy and expansion um, for your organization. So that leads me to my next point though. We wanna to continue to grow our organizations. We want to continue to be wildly successful, of course, so that we can be uh, profitable or so that we can meet our mission and so that we can build a culture of success that our employees want to continually be involved in. So if we want to build a culture of success and growth and learning, then the first thing that I believe that we should do is focus on our own growth and learning as leaders. And so that takes me to the second point here. When we are new in our leadership, we need to continue to be committed to continue growth and learning. We want to ensure that we stay humble about what we know and that we have a plan for our own continued growth. So back in 2000, I started my MBA program and I did it in part because I wanted to set myself apart from others as someone who was committed to continued growth, continued learning and improvement. And at that time, I was working in a local K-8 school district here in Arizona. And so of course, one of the core values of the organization was continued learning. And most of my colleagues were pursuing a master's in education or education administration. And here I was kind of on the fringes working on my MBA with a focus in HR management. So a little bit of an oddball out. But I did that because I really wanted to be poised and positioned to make a career industry change if I wanted to. So I was working in organizational leadership, focusing on the human resources practice side of the thing. Um, and then in 2007, really decided that I was ready to make that jump. And so I went and dove headlong into full-time HR consulting with a national payroll and HR outsourcing firm. And that was an exceptional experience. The resources that they provided to us as team members really helped us ramp up quickly to learn and grow. Um, and it was a great place for me to learn the importance of balancing relationships and knowledge. So again, back to that first point, we want to avoid being the expert in everything. We want to bring our expertise to the table in a way that empowers others to continue to grow, learn, and be successful. So I dove into this HR consulting role, full-time HR leadership, and I really you know, had to recommit to learning because the transition wasn't perfect. I had a lot to learn. You know, Not having been an HR practitioner full-time, I was already writing policies and procedures. I was recruiting and hiring and training hundreds of employees every year but I wasn't focused in the compliance side of things. I had worked on rules and regulations in my operations leadership role, but it wasn't my primary focus um, as my HR um, career was blossoming, though I realized that that was a, a great place for me to be and a great place for me to focus my time. So I pursued my HR certifications and continued on with that because that specialized learning, which of course has been very valuable along the way. And I found that being tuned in and tapped into a network of other professionals who were constantly learning and growing, much like we are here today, is just so energizing. It just fills my bucket, it lights my fire, whatever you wanna call it. There's nothing like being surrounded by other people who are committed to learning and growth. 
And so continued my career and have continued learning ever since. And at some point, um, let's see, many years ago now, maybe about 10 years ago, started to teach as well. And it's been a fabulous way to give back and contribute. So anyway, if there is a degree or a certification or some type of learning that you are hoping to pursue that will help to move your, your professional journey forward or to fill your professional growth bucket, then I say go for it, map it out and get a plan together. And if there is a conference or an event or a learning session, something that you want to attend to increase your areas of expertise, use your professional communication skills, your expert communication skills and pitch it to your boss. Don't be shy. We have to sometimes advocate for ourselves for uh, budgets for continued learning and that's okay too. So the more that we learn and grow as leaders, I feel that that is an exceptional example for our teams because teams that are focused on learning and growth are poised to be open to the conversation that there's a better way to do things, that maybe there's a different way that we can do something. And so that is a spectacular way to prepare ourselves to create a culture of accountability. And that's the third point that I wanted to go over today. As leaders, if we fail to take a stance of personal accountability in our leadership or fail to create a culture of accountability in our organizations, our goals will be hard to reach and the relationships that we have with others on our team may, may struggle. They may be strained from time to time because there is an air of fear or dissatisfaction when we have to talk about things like mistakes or why something went wrong and how we could do it better next time. So the first thing that I want us to do when we are thinking about building a culture of accountability, and of course, first and foremost, doing so as leaders, focusing on showing others by our example, what it looks like to be accountable in our professional um, setting, we wanna focus on building those genuine connections that we have with others, because it's through connection that we are able to tackle tough topics. And when we have open lines of communication built on trust and integrity, then this practice of holding one another accountable is made easier because we trust that it won't damage the relationship to a place that it isn't repairable. So I have worked with all kinds of leaders over the years. And I think back to 1993, my first job, and I had a leader named Samantha, and she was just absolutely amazing. And we worked in uh, a play place, you know, kind of like a Chuck E. Cheese in Maplewood, Minnesota. And so it was super busy, and it was really important that the employees were happy and engaged so that the clients could be well taken care of. And she was just an expert at quickly building trusting, caring relationships with her team. And I always knew that she cared about me. There was never a doubt that she cared about me. So when she came to me at different times and said that she needed me to do something a different way, I was responsive. I was ready to do it because I knew she cared about me. And I knew that where she was coming from was a place of care and concern for my success, that she wasn't trying to be nitpicky. She wasn't trying to ruin my day. She wasn't trying to be better than me or whatever the things that we tell ourselves, but she cared about me and she cared about my success at work. And so, you know, I think about her. I also think about a leader that I met in about 1999 or so. Her name was Candy Rausch. And for me, she taught me that if we take time to teach to our employees the importance of our organizational mission and vision, that we have such an easier time with decision-making. And so that's my, my second sort of highlight when we're thinking about building a culture of accountability and self-accountability, is that if we build our team around the core of our organization's mission, vision, and values, it makes it such a great anchor or a place to go to when we have to make tough decisions. And so she showed me that through normal communication, everyday communication, that we could embed that language into the way we talk to our employees, the way that we train them and coach them so that they would understand and we would all understand that our mission was to create memorable learning experiences. And that's what the, that, that was really our mission, to create memorable learning experiences. And so we 
focused on that when we wanted to make tough decisions about what to do, whether it was performance or behavior or whatever it was. So Candy was great. She was a great example of that. And the last example that I want to share was a gentleman named Tom White. And I met Mr. White in about 2013. And he really taught me to be comfortable with the things that I couldn't change and not dwell on things that were outside of my control because it was kind of just burn an extra oil. We didn't need to do that. Um, I needed to get focused on possibilities instead of barriers. And so when we would come up against a problem or a mistake had been made, he helped me to understand that the best way I could support my team is to be accountable for the barrier or the mistake, to not blame others or, you know, um, otherwise say that it wasn't our fault that this was happening or the oh woe is me attitude, but to take hold of the situation and be as positive as possible and work with what we had. So I appreciate those three lessons that I learned along the way. They've really helped me to um, try to work to build a culture of accountability on my team, but also they are good ways for me to reflect and to see if I'm honoring those leaders that spent time um, encouraging me to grow. So I've also worked with leaders who backtracked and that were, you know, did not come good on their commitments that maybe lied or blamed other team members for mistakes that they had made. And we know that that can be very damaging and can create a super toxic work environment. So to the extent that we find ourselves looking in that direction to solve a problem or relieve some sort of pressure or stress in our leadership position, we should refrain from engaging in those types of behaviors because they really damage relationships with coworkers um, and they can sometimes damage them to the place that they're not able to be repaired. And you know, thinking about this culture of accountability, thinking about building you know, some self-awareness around it too, how am I doing as a leader? You know, I want new HR leaders to think about engaging in really sensitive and sometimes difficult conversations with their team members about how they're doing, whether it's a 360 degree review or some other way to communicate with your team um, and get feedback from them about how they're doing. Engage in the practice of looking for feedback from your team members, ask them how they're doing, make sure that they're understanding the mission, vision, values, goals, and priorities of your team, and success is absolutely inevitable. So those are the three, you know, different, the three different mistakes that I want you to try to avoid. I want you to focus on instead building a team of capable experts around you instead of being the one with all the answers. That was our number one. Number two, in review, I want you to focus on never stopping learning. Make it that simple. I'll never stop learning. Make a commitment to continued growth, um, continued professional growth and personal growth, and also working to ensure that you're building a culture of personal accountability that will then lend itself to um, a culture of accountability across your organization. So those are the three areas of focus that I've found to be very impactful and powerful in my professional growth along the years. And so I wanted to share them with you. And I also wanted to make mention that as we grow in our leadership, we're, we're not stagnant beings. We are always constantly changing and growing. So we, we want to make sure that we are able to align our professional growth and our personal style in order to find continued and long-term success. And so what I think would be a good first step would be to clearly identify and share your own values with your team and encourage them to do that with you as well. That'll be a great team building activity. But when we engage in these types of activities, it makes it easy for people to see why we take the actions that we do as leaders, because if we value professional growth and learning and accountability, integrity, you know, those sorts of things. If we share that those are our strongly held beliefs and values with our team, they will understand where we're coming from when we make certain decisions, even really tough decisions. The next thing that I'd like you to think about doing is to set professional goals that inspire you personally. So picking up uh, a course on an area of practice in HR that is really energizing to you would be a good first move. Um, or helping to share your expertise with others in the profession might be inspiring as well, learning to, to teach what you know. But find ways within your own professional development to continue to fuel your, your fire, which is your motivation or your inspiration to do well on your team. 
And then lastly, I want you to stay true to your professional mission or your why, as some people call it, and stay focused on making the most of every situation that you have in front of you. You know, make sure that you're aligning your values with your profession. So for me, that means that I have taken time out to teach, but I also spend time volunteering. I volunteer with Junior Achievement of Arizona, and I'm a volunteer board member for an organization here called Steps of Love. And both of those organizations focus on setting children and youth up for success in education, work, and life. And so I've taken and wrapped into my professional growth, my uh, personal values of continued education and care for our community. And you know, I think that the underlying mission of it all is super important too. And so I'll share with you my mission and, and you can think about developing your own. But you know, I feel that my mission in this world is to create a positive ripple through the practice of HR. And I think that it's really inevitable that we would do this, that this positive ripple would become a reality when we focus on creating places to work that people love. So if people love where they're working, it makes problem solving easier, it makes relationships stronger, and that goes and it spills out into our communities and it spills into our homes and it improves the world overall. So keep doing what you're doing, HR heroes and HR leaders out there. You know, I want you to work on establishing your mission, establish your why, and make a positive impact as far and wide as you can and impact as many lives positively as you can. And then I would encourage you to recharge and keep on going. So I wish you the very best in your new HR leadership career. And I wanna just leave us here with a, a little bit of optional homework and it's a journal activity. So you can grab your paper and pen after this session or later today, whenever it makes sense for you. And I want you to do this journal activity um, in a time when you can think about committing to long-term success as an HR leader. And so you'll list one leadership activity that you'll commit to that will help you be successful leading your team. So maybe it's something that we talked about today or maybe it's something different. And then I want you to write a quick action plan. So if you're committed to that activity, what will you do in order to increase your chances of success? So that little journal activity leads me to my final closing and a special invitation like I promised you in the beginning. So I'd love to keep this conversation going. Being an HR leader can be daunting, it can be scary at times, and I know that it can be lonely. So please connect with me on LinkedIn or reach out to me otherwise, and I would be happy to go over your homework assignment with you or answer some other pressing HR question that you have. And so thank you so much for your time today. It's an absolute pleasure and a sincere honor to have you in this session. And I wish you nothing but wild success.